saying? All right, so we are being recorded. Now, before we, we turn to W.E.B. Du Bois, um, I wonder if you guys uh, still have questions or would benefit from a further discussion and clarifying of some of the paradoxes from David Lewis. So we didn't get to address in any explicit detail uh, the argument in connection to the so-called grandfather paradox. And we started last time to address uh, the causal loops issue. Um, but what do you guys think? Did you want to, to talk just a little bit more about those two paradoxes in case you're interested in uh, writing about that topic for the final paper? Or do you just want to move on to today's reading? I don't really mind. Does anybody? We should talk a little bit more about it. Okay, was that Ollie? Yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah, we can take um, 15 or 20 minutes or so, and we will leave early. I mean, this is um, painful <laughs> and ridiculous, uh, these poorly attended classes. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get out of here a little bit early, say at noon or so. Um, but let's jump back into the David Lewis discussion. So I have my slides available. Let me just share the screen. I do appreciate you guys um, coming to class. All right, let me just here it is. Grab my David Lewis paper here. All right, so what, who can just lay it out there for us in your own language, what the, the paradox, what this particular logical problem surrounding causal reversals or causal loops, um, where does that emerge in Lewis's paper? Um, so what exactly is the issue here? So what are these causal loops? Can anyone just sort of briefly give an account of the situation that he mentions. And this is what we ended class with last time. And I asked you to consider whether there was an example of this potentially presented in the Ray Bradbury theater uh, adaptation of Sound of Thunder. Um, so we were talking about that at the very end of class last time. Does anyone want to take a stab at it? Are you asking number one or number two? Um, well, I'm not asking oh, okay. about the premises of this argument, just in a general way, using your own language, what is the problem of causal loops? So David Lewis uses a specific example that we were talking about last time. Isn't uh, it? Oh. oh, go ahead. Isn't it that like if something was to be changed in the past, like it's going to affect the future? Uh, well, here we're talking about a loop, <laughs> um, a causal loop. So what is causation? We were talking about this in the context of David Hume and the problem of induction, right? So. Uh, the previous week, not last week, but the previous week, and we sort of continue that discussion last week. Um, but cause and effect, uh, so that's the, the, the basic mechanism through which we navigate the world inductively, right? We make um, inferences about what will happen based upon 
how we have um, apprehended the world through the course of our past experience, right? Um, and so how does that work for us? Because we realize that given a certain phenomenon, there would have to be the emergence or accompaniment of another phenomenon in a necessary way. So in the Hume conversation, I used fire as an example. So there's a causal relationship between heat and flame. That is to say, if there is flame, then there's necessarily going to be heat because heat is the effect of flame as a cause, right? Um, but if time travel is possible, then the very determinacy of the um, unidirectional pattern that all causal events take would be completely interrupted and confused, right? Um, so he gives one example of a causal reversal such that just before getting into a time machine, someone punches you in the face, right? Then you go back in time, say a couple days, and now a bruise develops in your eye. Um, and now it's weird. There seems to be a curious situation in which the effect happened before the cause <laughs> because you went back in time, right? So your bruise develops temporally prior to what you understand to be the cause of that bruise, the punch in the face, right? Does that, so that's a causal reversal. Now, recall the scenario of you going back in time and then picking up the phone and contacting your younger self by a telephone conversation. And let's say in the course of that telephone conversation, you, the older self who went back in time, informs the younger self on how to build a time machine. So now the younger self, the younger version of you, just develops in the natural way and some time passes and you build a time machine. How did you know how to build the time machine? Well, because this future version of yourself went back in time and contacted you and told you how to do it. So, um, <laughs> How did that happen? Where did the information as to how to build the time machine first come from, right? Well, apparently, given the cause and effect relationship, it came from when your older self went back in time and instructed your younger self. Um, but how did your older self get the information in the first place? Well, because <laughs> your younger self developed in a natural way and had the information it seems now because your older self went back in time. So you're in a sort of causal loop where the cause and the effect are indeterminate. The effect seems to be the cause or the cause seems to be the effect. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes a lot more sense than yeah. last time. I was in the last class and that was not making much sense to me. Okay, yeah. I mean, it makes complete right. sense now. Good, that's why I thought we should take some more time on it because we got into this paradox sort of close to the very end of class. Yeah. And so the example that I was suggesting that we witnessed, although um, in a subtle way, in that episode, uh, The Sound of Thunder that we watched, was that, uh, remember, um, this is one of the major rules that allows this sort of fictional um, time safari operation uh, to legally operate. Uh, the rule is, you can't kill any animal that had a future, right? So they go back in time uh, and they find an animal, in this case, it was a Tyrannosaurus Rex that was going to die at a particular moment. And so they tagged it and then took the safari goer, goer <laughs> took him back there and said, you have to kill this animal at this precise time. And that was to avoid any sort of undue influence um, on the future, which would cause this sort of cascading uh, series of, of horrific, um, um, ultimately transformative events that couldn't be reversed, uh, as we saw happened when the character ste stepped on the butterfly, right? Um, and so in this particular case, the story was there was a tree that was going to fall on the Tyrannosaurus Rex at a particular time. And that was the moment in time that was marked for the T-Rex the, the T is uh, being shot down, right? Yet the, the um, safari goer, uh, the customer um, sort of 
in a moment of panic, completely lost his shit and uh, just indiscriminately fired um, his, his machine gun all over the forest. And then it seemed like that's what caused the tree to fall. <laughs> so that's an instance of a causal loop because it's not clear what, um, where the information came from, right? So this is the sense in which we're dealing with uncaused information. So there's information about the tree falling, but it's not clear how it was caused because it wasn't originally supposed to be the effect of this jackass indiscriminately firing his machine gun into the trees. Um, yet it seems from the perspective of the viewer that that's really what happened, right? Um, so does it, so hopefully this makes sense. So this is the paradox. If time travel is possible, then we can run into all kinds of situations like this, um, such that there are causal loops, ca causal reversals, and therefore uncaused information. Yet, there cannot be causal loops. That's a kind of contradiction. <laughs> um, therefore, we can conclude that time travel is not possible. Okay, now, who remembers how David Lewis responds to this particular problem? Because remember, the whole crux of his argument is to either um, dissolve or resolve, as the case may be, the paradoxes as they arise. Um, so his argument is these paradoxes only appear to be paradoxical. And after careful illumination and clarification, uh, we can either resolve them through a sort of logical argument or dissolve them as superficial problems of language. Um, so what is his strategy when it comes to the second paradox? So I don't quite remember what his strategy was, but I was thinking about like the time machine loop where like um, an older self tells a younger self how to build it. And what if like to start the loop, there's like a third stage of you that told the previous older self how to build it and the older self told the younger self. And that's how the loop started from like a third stage. Uh, maybe, but we don't have that information. But it could be that that's what Lewis might say. I mean, he could give you, um, and he does something similar when it comes to the more famous grandfather paradox. He could give you all sorts of scenarios that could be put forward to plausibly explain what seems to be inexplicable, right? Um, and so there could be an explanation and you could sort of rack your brain <laughs> In, in all sorts of ways to, to devise or to contrive um, an account that would satisfy that question. Um, but he takes an easier route. <laughs> um, and so for this reason, um, it seems to be a very easy route actually, the strategy he adopts. And for this reason, among all of the arguments that we find in the paper, this is the, the one that's more frequently criticized because it seems to be the least satisfying. Um, but does anyone remember in the text where he, he addresses this? Are you talking about the grandfather paradox? No, we haven't gotten there yet. Uh, oh, okay, all right, just making sure. Yeah, this is the causal loop paradox. Well, he says, where did the information come from? So we're dealing with that specific example um, of the older self going back in time, having a conversation with the younger self and because of that relationship, there seems to be no original source of the information yet. So this is a causal loop, but if you examine the steps, the individual steps within the loop as a whole, so if you just take parts of the structure, um, it's, it's logically sound. Um, and that's because you could ask the question, okay, well, how did this person learn how to build the time machine? Because the older self went back in time and taught them. So when you just examine those local steps within the constitution of the whole scenario, uh, taking into account the future and the past, that makes sense. But it's only when you look at the structure as a whole um, uh, that you find the real loop. But he says, 
Where did the information come from in the first place? Why did the whole affair happen? There is simply no answer. The parts of the loop, as I just said, are explicable. The whole of it is not. Strange, but not impossible, and not too different from inexplicabilities we are already inured to. Almost everyone agrees that God or the Big Bang or the entire infinite past of the universe or the decay of the tritium atom is uncaused and inexplicable. Then if these are possible, why not also the inexplicable causal loops that arise in the time travel? So here's how he handles it. <laughs> we preserve the sense of the first premise. So if time travel is possible, then there could be causal loops um, and uncaused information, like how to build a time machine. He simply denies the truth of the second premise, that there could not be causal loops. So if you recall the few instances over the course of this quarter in which we have explicitly uh, criticized or addressed arguments, that is, uh, these argumentative logical structures composed of premises and conclusions, you'll recall that there are two strategies that one can take. So the first is to show that the argument is invalid. And that's what we did with the first paradox, the paradox between time and time, that is uh, personal time and external time. Uh, we found that the paradoxicality of the issue turned on an ambiguity of language, an equivocation between um, one instance of the word time in one premise and another instance of the word time in the second premise. And if we were to clarify that ambiguity and qualify each instance to say in premise one, we're talking about um, personal time, in premise two, we're talking about external time or objective time, however you wanna put it, then the paradox is dissolved. So that's an, an instance of, of Lewis dissolving the paradox, showing that it's not paradoxical at all once the language is sufficient, sufficiently illuminated. Um, so that would be to demonstrate the invalidity of the argument. But in this case, the second strategy that's available for us in terms of criticizing arguments is taken. And that is to show even if the structure is valid, and validity, remember, is a technical term, meaning that in a, in a deductive argument, given true premises, the conclusion is necessarily true. So it's impossible when it comes to a valid argument form for the premises to be true, yet the conclusion to be false. Um, but there are all sorts of horrible arguments that you would not find compelling at all that are nevertheless structurally valid, such as the argument, the moon is made of cheese, all cheese is delicious, therefore the moon is delicious. That's a valid argument. Given the premises, if we accept them as true, the conclusion is necessarily true. It cannot be false. Um, yet, we don't think the premises are true. We don't think the moon is made of cheese and it's obviously false that all cheese is delicious. Um, so then that strategy is to show even if we have a valid argumentative structure, the premises themselves are not true. And for that reason, the argument, while valid, is unsound. Um, so soundness is the broader criterion, which actually has two smaller criteria that compose it. So the truth of the premises and the structural validity of the argument form. So in this case, what Lewis is doing is denying the truth of the second premise. He's saying that that is false. Um, he said there could be <laughs> causal loops. If there were causal loops, then that mean that there that would mean, and this is the the difficulty. This is the issue. That would mean that there is some um, originary information, some causal source of effectuality and eventuality. So the very material through its event through which events happen that could not ever be explained or made sense of um, in the relationship to that which we take them in certain scenarios to have caused. Um, but he says, think about a common religious explanation of the universe. Everything was created by God. And so there's a, an ancient argument for the existence of God known as the cosmological argument, which says 
that everything that exists, every object and event is the effect of some prior cause. And so I am the effect of my parents, they are the effect of their parents, they are the effect of their parents, and so on and so on. You could go back into the darkest recesses of human history until natural history prior to the emergence of human consciousness or even animal life and the universe, you could keep going farther and farther back until at some point you would have to arrive at a beginning. And so that would be a cause which itself is uncaused. Aristotle argued that this is um, God as the unmoved mover, the first cause. So God is the first cause and as the unmoved mover is the motive force that initiates all change in the cosmos, but is itself not amenable to such change, remains impervious or outside of uh, the force of such change. Um, and so a common religious argument terminates this whole uh, chain of causal explanations at the originated, originary point of divine creation. Similarly, one common argument in the natural sciences in terms of cosmology and cosmogony, cosmogony being the study of the origin of the cosmos or the universe, is that it all began in a big bang. Um, now, what caused the big bang? I don't know, because that's supposed to be similar to God in the cosmological argument, the first cause. Um, so what caused that? Well, I don't know, it's not explicable yet. Uh, many scientific researchers simply accept it, right? So he's saying, if we, are, if we ordinarily are inured to this sort of mysteriousness, this sort of strangeness in terms of the basic mechanics and causal origination of the universe as a whole, well then why should we be so worried about these causal loops that are implied as a possibility when we're entertaining the logic of time travel? Some stuff is just unexplained and um, we can accept that. So what do you guys think about this? But does this argument make sense? So Charles, you're good on this. Does anyone have any questions? It makes more sense now. Okay, cool. All right, but like I said, it's not entirely satisfying because his answer is, well, there is no answer, maybe, and, and that's fine. Well, that's uh, exactly what I was thinking. The fact that there's no answer is just kind of, I guess, weird. Yeah, I mean, like Charles suggested, you can rack your brain and spend an infinite amount of time coming up with ways to explain it. Um, but then, of course, you have the problem of, of the third man, to use Charles's effort, of this third iteration or version of yourself that's relaying the information on how to build a time machine. But then you might ask, okay, well, where did that information come from? <laughs> and then you would have to supply uh, some more information in unpacking the narrative or the story even further, right? <laughs> okay. So now let's let's deal with the more famous grandfather paradox, and then we'll we'll change we'll we'll stop this and then um, transition really abruptly to the W. E. B. Du Bois discussion. Um, but the grandfather paradox. So can anyone, just in your own words, briefly set up? And this was something that the presenters discussed, of course, last week. But can someone just briefly uh, um, relay the story? of what's going on in this paradox, the grandfather paradox. Yeah, so there's this kid named, I guess, Tim, who hates his grandfather. So he goes back in time and kills him. Um, if by killing his grandfather, he essentially kills his father because if his grandfather didn't exist, he, um, his father wouldn't, so he wouldn't either. And if he didn't exist, there'd be no one to kill his grandfather. So his grandfather will, would be alive, which would make him exist and so on. Yeah, so what, what makes this a paradox? It's, it's, I guess maybe it's because like a causational loop. 
Um, well, it's not a loop anymore, necessarily. So basically that it's like physically impossible for him to kill his grandfather. So if we're dealing with a paradox, then that, to put it very simply, is a situation in which you have um, a pair of mutually contradictory terms or um, details of a situation, right? So on the one side of the situation, you have what appears to be the impossibility of Tim successfully killing his grandfather, because that would result obviously in his own dissolution, his own annihilation, uh, which would mean um, maybe that he would just disappear. Um, but then how would he, the further question is, how would he have been able then to have made the time machine or to have existed at all in his entire life to have made the time machine and come back? Um, so then <laughs> he would disappear, but then maybe his grandfather, uh, I don't know, it's, 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 it's difficult to imagine what would happen, but that's still on one side of the paradoxical situation. But what's the other side of it? I mean, that's kind of what we're looking at here in this slide. I mean, in science fiction scenarios, such as in The Sound of Thunder, the story in which the question was asked, well, could we potentially pass our earlier selves on their return trip? Um, and it was mentioned by the safari guide that it's impossible for one to meet an earlier version of oneself through time travel, that there's something built in to the metaphysics of time to prevent that. And this is the kind of mechanism that David Lewis describes as a cosmic chaperone. So there's something about nature which intervenes to prevent this sort of thing from happening. Um, and um, different sci-fi scenarios, you know, illustrate this uh, arrangement or uh, what nature can do to forestall or to reverse these interruptions in different imaginistic ways. Um, but leaving aside any sort of fantastical account that we would arbitrarily have to come up with, as was depicted in the Bradbury story, to, to show how this wouldn't happen because nature would intervene, um, we can just imagine Tim as a physical human being, just as capable of firing a rifle as anybody is. And the conditions are right. He has the ability, he has a functional firearm. Um, he sees his father or grandfather. He's an easy target 20 yards away from the roof of the building. There's no physical reason to suggest why Tim would not be successful or could not be successful in the task, right? So on one hand, it seems like Tim can kill his grandfather just as easily as anybody could kill his grandfather. And so this is why he mentions Tom, a non-time traveling duplicate of Tim. So let's say that down the street, there is Tom, another sniper who is from the 1920s. He did not go back in time. And he's waiting for, it turns out, this person is grandfather's partner because he doesn't like him. Tom is not a time traveler, but otherwise he is perfectly identical to Tim. He has all the relevant properties that Tim has in terms of his ability to take a successful shot. There's no reason that Tom would fail in the task. So given that all the conditions are being equal, so this is um, what analytic philosophers call ceteris paribus. So all conditions being equal, um, except for the quality of Tim being a time traveler and Tom not. So it seems like he could, just like Tom could, right? But this is what we were mentioning is the obvious horn of the dilemma, the obviously problematic side of the paradox. Grandfather begat Tim's father in 1922, who begat Tim in 1949. 
now relative to these facts. So knowing as we do, we're a sort of privileged reader taking an account, taking a view of this time travel scenario. Um, we have available to us then these facts. So relative to our knowledge or understanding of these facts and how they're salient to the situation, we recognize the impossibility of Tim's task. Because even leaving aside time travel, uh, just um, basic temporality and the flow of time, uh, if someone is alive in, say, 2021 to, um, uh, I don't know, make a television interview that's publicly documented and available for anyone to see, well, then logically that tells you, given the fact that so-and-so appeared on a television interview on, say, June 3rd, 2021, relative to the knowledge of that fact, it is also known by a logical inference that that individual could not have died, say, on February, or excuse me, May 29th, 2021, or February 2021, or sometime in 2020. So just like a non-time traveling situation, we would be in possession of these relevant facts, which would lead us by way of logical conclusion, logical inference, to recognize that this is an impossibility, right? <laughs> Sorry, I had a little fun with that. Um, but here's David Lewis's response. What I can do, what anyone can do, relative to one set of facts, one might not be able to do relative to another more inclusive set of those facts. So he says, facts about my larynx, so your vocal cords, for example, and nervous system are composable with my speaking Finnish, but don't take me along to Helsinki as your interpreter. So this is a sort of unusual word, but using context clues and just the um, familiar word parts that make it up, does anyone want to, to hazard a guess at what the definition of compossible or compossibility is? I guess like able to. Um, so ability or capability. And so if you're able to do something, uh, well, obviously that implies that whatever it is that you're able to do is possible, right? So ability, capability, possibility, these are connected concepts, right? But what does com possible think you mean? So we're talking about the com possibility of certain facts. So think about where com shows up in different English language words. What does this prefix indicate? You does it mean like with something else it's possible? Because like, yeah. um, like compare two things, com, community, yeah. So. Exactly, yeah. So com derives from Latin and it essentially means with, right? So uh, possible with, <laughs> uh, so um, <clears throat> uh, if I say that you give a television interview on June 3rd, 2021, that's a fact um, and it's composable with other facts such as um, you going to the coast for a weekend prior to that, right? That's possible. Um, but you being dead <laughs> the prior weekend is not possible, or you being in a, in a sort of irreversible coma, for example, is not compossible with the fact of you delivering or providing a television interview on June 3rd, 2021, right? Um, so Lewis uses this example. Facts about his larynx and nervous system are compossible with his speaking finish. So the Fact is, as a normal functioning human being, he has the physical equipment, the organs that are necessary for anyone to learn a language and to speak that language. Um, but 
just because it's possible in that sense for Lewis to speak Finnish, uh, he warns you not to take him to Helsinki with you as your interpreter, right? So what is his point there? What is he saying? So because I am equipped with a functional, ordinary, more or less ordinary human nervous system and larynx, um, along with some other necessary elements, arguably, it's possible that I could speak Finnish, right? So in one sense, I could speak Finnish, uh, but I would say the same. <laughs> um, don't take me along with, with you to Helsinki as your interpreter. So what is, what is he saying? What is his point here? Anybody want to guess? Want to try to explain his argument? I would think he kind of means like just because something can do something doesn't mean it actually does something. Well, you're almost there. I would change your sentence there and say just because somebody can do something doesn't mean that they can do something. You see what I mean? Just because I can speak Finnish doesn't mean that I can speak Finnish. So what's going on in that sentence? If I were to tell you that, how would you make sense of that? It seems to be a contradiction, but in what way is it not a contradiction? So contradiction is another way to put paradox, right? Well, let's think about the scenario some more. So Tim's killing grandfather that day in 1921, Tim being the time traveler, right, is composable with all the facts of the sort we would ordinarily count as relevant in saying what someone can do. Uh, relative to these facts, Tim can kill his grandfather. So what are these facts? The fact that Tim is physically present at the appropriate spot in 1921 that he has a functional rifle, so it works, that he has ammunition for the rifle, um, that meteorological conditions are sufficiently clear, that Tim is able to see his target, that Tim has um, adequate training in how to operate the rifle. He knows how to use it. He can succeed at the task. So relative to all of those facts, it seems that Tim can kill his grandfather. But Tim's killing his grandfather is not composable with another more inclusive set of facts, including the simple fact <laughs> that grandfather was not killed in 1921. And we know that that's a fact because grandfather gave birth to Tim's father in 1922, who gave birth to Tim in 1948, right? Relative to that set of facts, it seems that Tim cannot kill grandfather, just like relative to the fact, if it were a fact, that you give a television interview on June 3rd, 2021, it is not composable with you dying or entering an irreversible, irreversible coma on June 1st, 2021, right? Um, so because I have a normal functioning nervous system, um, uh, an adequate, <laughs> 
um, structure or, or ability of cognition. I have uh, a functional set of larynx. I could learn Finnish. But so that, that means I can learn Finnish in the same way that you can learn Finnish or no Finnish um, or Robbie can know Finnish or Nancy, all of us as human beings um, with all of the necessary physical um, abilities, all those necessary conditions being met, we can speak Finnish. It's possible. That is to say it's composable with other facts uh, which we exemplify. Um, factual conditions which we meet. Yet, I never went about the necessary process of learning Finnish. I never studied at a university. I never went to Finland to immerse myself in the culture and language. I never purchased or studied any Finnish language learning books or other such materials. So relative to those facts, I can't speak Finnish. <laughs> And for that reason, you shouldn't take me along with you to Helsinki as your interpreter. So that's the point Lewis is making. So then just like he did with the very first argument, which gave us apparently a paradox uh, between time and time, it was shown that that argument, uh, which concluded against the possibility of time travel because of the paradox, that that argument was invalid because it turned on a concealed equivocation between the word time in the first premise and the word time in the second premise. So Lewis is doing something very comparable here and arguing that um, we're equivocating with respect to the word could or can. And so the exact same thing goes for Tom's parallel failure. For Tom to kill grandfather's partner, that's also composable with all facts of the sort that we ordinarily count as relevant. But if it turns out that Tom's, um, uh, that grand, um, Tim's uh, grandfather's partner that Tom wants to kill lived past 1922, right? In this case, we see that he lived until 1934. So if somehow those facts were available to us, we would have a more inclusive set, a more detailed, a more exhaustive or comprehensive set of facts, which would show us the impossibility of the purported event. So here's how he handles this argument, uh, which seems to result in the impossibility of time travel because of the necessary arising of this particular paradox. So if time travel is possible, then Tim could kill his grandfather for the reasons that we've enumerated. Premise two, if time travel is possible, then Tim could not kill his grandfather. The conclusion, um, because that's a contradiction that arises given the very entertainment, so the possibility of time travel, we can conclude that time travel is not possible. But how does he address that? <laughs> Just like we did with the first argument, we fix the equivocation. So we clarify the confused or opaque language. So now if we clarify the ambiguity in the first premise and the second, we can say if time travel is possible, then holding fixed only the facts of the past, Tim could kill his grandfather. So understanding only the details of the past, which in Tim's case as the time traveler would be the present where he is in terms of, of his uh, subjective time, right? He would be there. So it seems that he could kill his grandfather. But if time travel is possible, moving to the second premise, then holding fixed only the facts of the future, which include the fact that Tim's grandfather lived to give birth to his son, Tim's father, in 1922, who then went on to give birth to Tim in 1948. So holding fixed the facts of the future with respect to 1922, it's obvious that Tim could not kill his grandfather. So once we clarify what's going on in each of the premises, we can see that the conclusion is not warranted. So according to Lewis, and here's the explanation in red, the argument is not valid because it equivocates with the word could. Similarly, in one sense, I could speak Finish since I have the necessary physical parts and cognitive ability, but in another sense, I could not 
speak Finnish since I've never learned the language. So this is what I meant when I said, um, just because one can do something doesn't mean that one can do something. And although that appears to be nonsense, that seems to be a contradiction or a paradox, once you clarify what can means, it's no longer so, it's no longer a paradox. So does this make sense? And now let's just conclude <laughs> with this major upshot. So this is how um, Lewis concludes the argument. So if you supposed him to kill grandfather and hold all the rest of his story fixed, of course you get a contradiction uh, because then it seems that Tim wouldn't be alive <laughs> in order to have built the time machine and then go back in time to kill grandfather. Um, so that's the contradiction. But likewise, if you suppose Tom to kill grandfather's partner and hold the rest of his story fixed, including the part that told of his failure, you get a contradiction. Um, if you make any counterfactual supposition and hold all else fixed, you get a contradiction. The thing to do is, so counterfactual just means uh, knowing what we know happened, um, the counterfact, so a plausible alternative as a contingency to uh, the factuality of the event that has been verified through experience. So for example, it's a fact that right now my cell phone is on the table, but a counterfactual supposition would be the cell phone is in my pocket, right? Because it's not necessary that I located my cell phone in this specific spot. Um, but if you make any counter, counterfactual supposition you hold all and hold all else fixed, you get a contradiction. The thing to do is rather to make the counterfactual supposition and hold all else as close to fixed as you consistently can. That procedure will yield perfectly consistent answers to the question. What if Tim had not killed grandfather? In that case, some of the story I told would not have been true. Perhaps Tim might have been the time traveling grandson of someone else. Uh, excuse me, actually, this is an error. I just noticed a typo. <laughs> um, and I think it's actually a typo from our reading. Let me see. But I don't, know, I don't wanna waste any more time with it. This should say, what if Tim had killed grandfather? <laughs> so there could be some confusion here. Um, so what if Tim had killed grandfather in 1922? He pulled the trigger, shot him dead. Well, in that case, some of the story I told would not have been true. Namely, the part of the story um, where <laughs> uh, Tim was actually uh, a time traveler or Tim was actually the grandson of this person that he killed. All of those things would now be rendered uh, dubious, um, to say the least, unthinkable in the strong sense. So perhaps Tim might have been the time traveling grandson of somebody else. Maybe he thought he was killing his grandfather, but uh, accidentally shot somebody else. Perhaps he might have been the grandson of a man killed in 1921 and miraculously resurrected. Uh, so actually, if you, if you examine the scholarly literature <laughs> on this paradox, you'll encounter all sorts of strange and fanciful solutions to the problem. Uh, one particularly weird one is after Tim successfully shoots his grandfather while his grandfather is dying, but before he dies, uh, grandmother, for whatever reason, uh, initiates sexual intercourse. <laughs> and that's sufficient to give birth to Tim's father and then to Tim, <laughs> right? Perhaps he might have not been a time traveler at all, or rather someone created out of nothing in 1920, equipped with false memories of a personal past that never was. It's hard to say what is the least revision of Tim's story to make it true that Tim kills grandfather, but certainly the contradictory story in which the killing both does and doesn't occur is not the least revision. Hence, it is false, according to the unrevised story, that if Tim had killed grandfather, then contradictions 
would have been true. Okay. So what, in a nutshell, <laughs> what is Lewis really saying here? If you could pull out a straightforward answer to this paradox, what is he saying? And from what I understand, there is real no, no real clear answer to it. Well, it's a little subtle. I mean, he seems to be saying there's no contradiction in this. So you might conclude from that that Tim um, uh, could kill grandfather and could not guilt, kill grandfather. But um, since could is an equivocation, then we'll just leave that aside and not necessarily have to give one determinate answer because the answer you give will vary depending upon whether uh, you're dealing with the less inclusive set of facts tied to the past or the more inclusive set of facts connected to the future. Um, so it seems in a straightforward reading of Lewis's argument here that you have to make a choice. Am I going to choose to interpret uh, the scenario in the light of one set of facts or the other? And depending upon the choice, I'll arrive at one conclusion or another. And that seems to be a really complicated way of simply not answering the question, <laughs> right? But if you really pay attention to the argument and you tease out its deeper consequences and implication, what he really seems to be saying is it's not possible for Tim to kill his grandfather. Um, and if it turns out because of the sci-fi scenario, or if you're dealing with the reality of some future state in which time traveling is possible, and this is a real situation that you have to try to explain or make sense of, um, his answer seems to be, it would not be possible. If it appears to be the case that someone went back in time and killed their grandfather, uh, then when you examine the more inclusive set of facts having to do with the facts of the future, then it would have to be the case that um, there are some erroneous details involved, that the person's not a time traveler, or if they are a time traveler, they're not actually killing their own um, ancestor or relative, <laughs> right? So the answer seems to be that it's not possible, right? Um, okay, so does that make sense? But that doesn't mean necessarily <laughs> that time traveling would be impossible. Uh, but he doesn't explain what that cosmic chaperone might be, <laughs> for example, that could intervene. Uh, but then another possible solution to the issue, which he just sort of briefly suggests, is uh, that of branching timelines. Right? So it could be that if Tim does successfully kill his grandfather, um, this won't erase his own future uh, generation and thus the very plausibility of his return to the past uh, because it will simply generate a new tangent, a new branch along the timeline. Um, and so now there will be a world in which the, in the future there is no Tim because Tim would have killed his grandfather. Uh, but Tim won't simply disappear um, he can live there now uh, in a world in which his grandfather no longer exists, and he might even be able to return to his own world. Uh, and if he does, um, he'll return to a world in which his grandfather lived, right? Because he won't be going to that tangent of the branching timeline. And so this takes up Lewis's metaphysics of time, um, in, in terms of the modality of possibility. So his plurality of worlds or possible worlds thesis or hypothesis. Okay, so does that make sense? All right. Um, so like I said, we'll get out of here a bit early, um, but I do want to get us started on the conversation on W.E.B. Du Bois. And so I really want to do just uh, some close reading together. And so 
I'm going to got it right. I have a question. Yeah, sure. So I was going ahead and I read the, the comment one as well yesterday. And did we already read that one before? Which one? The comment. No, that's assigned for Thursday. Oh, okay. Because I don't know, I was reading it and it like, as I was reading it, it sounded familiar, like if I had already read it. Huh. I don't know. Maybe okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'll show you. Let me share the screen. So you already read the comment then? Yeah, I did. Did you enjoy it? It was interesting. Okay, so yeah, so for um, Tuesday, this is for today, what we should have read. So um, just the forethought in the first chapter, which is labeled our spiritual strivings. And then um, for Thursday, we'll read the comment. Uh, so um, W.E.B. E. Du Bois, so I'll just read this little introduction I wrote up for him, um, was an important American sociologist. He was actually uh, the first person of color to graduate with a doctoral degree from Harvard, uh, which was quite remarkable. Um, he was an important sociologist, historian, writer, so he wrote fiction as well as nonfiction, so essays, uh, civil rights activist, and um, according to many, including myself, a philosopher. And so um, beyond his role in the founding of the NAACP, so the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People in 1909, Du Bois is perhaps most remembered for his concept of double consciousness, which is really going to be um, our thematic focus for this week, which he explores and theoretically defines in 1903 as the souls of black folk. Uh, but he had actually um, coined the phrase and explored it in an essay in the Atlantic um, a couple of years before that. And so double consciousness is a concept that Du Bois developed through close engagement with 19th century philosophy, particularly that of Hegel. So uh, um, this might resonate with your understanding of the Hegelian dialectic in terms of the master-slave dialectic that we talked about before and the, necess the necessity for personal identity of recognition, in particular, the equality of recognition. And so this is the condition of one's self-consciousness being split into two mutually antagonistic poles as a product of racialized oppression. So double consciousness, to say that again, it's the condition of one's self-consciousness being split into two mutually antagonistic poles as a product of racialized oppression as the effect or the result of such oppression. So Du Bois saw the double consciousness that characterized African-American identity as an ineluctable source of psychic tension. So ineluctable meaning um, unavoidable, irresolvable of psychic tension and anxiety, uh, a constantly being at odds with oneself, but not only this. Um, so it's um, less frequently, I think, emphasized the positive role of double consciousness, in which case it's characterized as a kind of gift. Um, du Bois refers to it as a second sight, according to which the marginalized and the oppressed have greater epistemic access to the deeper truths of reality than do the comfortable and the oppressed. Okay. Um, and so I mentioned last week that when we turn to this unit of the course, uh, in this case, since we have a truncated quarter, we'll have a, a truncated um, introduction and stay with the third unit of the class having to do with otherness. But as we venture into this third unit of the course, we're kind of um, returning to the beginning. We're coming full circle. Uh, and so um, just thinking about that double consciousness, um, we'll connect this to the conception of personal identity 
that we articulated in the context of Descartes, understanding Cartesian metaphysics. Uh, but just to set up the problem on page eight, um, I think this is a really lovely way to begin, and it, it connects uh, it connects what Du Bois was up to uh, over a um, hundred years ago um, to our present moment. <laughs> So he says, so dawned the time of storm and drang. A storm and stress today rocks our little boat on the mad waters of the world sea. There is within and without the sound of conflict, the burning of body and rending of soul. And so to my mind, um, there's perhaps no more powerful or evocative way to characterize uh, the tension of our present historical moment. Uh, and so it's very interesting to think of, of this being expressed in the context of racialized oppression um, so long ago. And now you entangle uh, that problem, that societal ill with the innumerable ones that we're confronting and, and trying to find ways to make sense of and, and effectively grapple with now. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, but what does Sturm und Drang mean? So that's German. Does anyone know what that means? Has anyone heard that phrase? It's often used uh, in English and preserved in the original German in that use. Does anyone know what that might mean? Sturm und Drang? Well, I mean, he defines it or um, translates it in the next couple of words, storm and stress. So storm and stress today rocks our little boat on the mad waters of the world sea. Um, and so let's go back a few weeks now, because I want to, uh, in pursuing metaphysics and epistemology here, um, so metaphysics is the branch philosophy that studies the nature of reality. Um, epistemology investigates the possibility and nature of human knowledge. Um, I want to connect this problem or concept of double consciousness to deeper metaphysical questions. So go back to Descartes, um, if you can. So think about Descartes. According to Descartes, what is the self? What is the I? What is personal identity? Like the way that we view ourselves or how we want to be viewed or like described. Um, well, remember, in the first unit of the class, we came up with various arguments, conclusions of arguments that would capture uh, what remains the same in terms of one's identity, despite all of the obvious uh, changes that one undergoes through time. So what is the self, according to Descartes? I wasn't it he was the one that described how like if you could think you were oh gosh I might be thinking of someone else but it's like your mind or something like that yeah so remember Descartes I think therefore I am cogito ergo yeah that's what it was so um what is existence well it's a thinking thing, at least if we're talking about human existence, the existence of personal identity. It is mind, consciousness, or soul, in other words. Um, so if you come to recognize in a deep way who you are, what your fundamental self is, despite superficial or profound bodily changes, psychological transformations, and so forth, what is it that remains the same? 
who are you? Well, it's, it's your mind. It's ultimately your capacity for reflective conceptual thought through which one might arrive at the determinant that is indubitable truth um, of reality. And so it turns out that that's which can perform various calculations uh, to pierce through falsity. Uh, and so that's what's presented in the famous ball of wax thought experiment. Um, so, uh, and remember one of the arguments that Descartes gave, and this was from the sixth meditation that we didn't read, but I presented you with this argument uh, in as much as it, it, it uh, stands as an improvement over the argument that comes from the second meditation. So remember, um, the argument goes like this, all physical things um, are, uh, or all bodily things are materially extended. That is, they have ex spatial extension. Um, so my body, this book, this cell phone, they're all materially extended, which means that they occupy some measurable volume of space and exclude other bodies from that space. Now, every physically or material extended thing is divisible. So my body is materially extended and an implication or consequence of that is it can be divided up and then measured in accordance with those divisions. So I could you know, cut my arm off <laughs> And then I could cut that arm in half and then cut that piece in half and cut that piece in half. And in principle, arrive at the subatomic, right? It's not physically possible, but mathematically it is. So one essential attribute of all material bodies is that they are infinitely um, divisible. Yet mind, Descartes argued, is not divisible. And it's not measurable in the way that material forms or objects are. And we can't impute or attribute certain um, observable physical qualities or properties to mind that we do to ordinary physical bodies, um, such as color or sound or weight. So it doesn't make sense to ask how much my thought, um, how much my thought of the summertime weighs, <laughs> or if I'm thinking about the summer, how much does that thought weigh? Uh, or what color is that thought? Um, those questions wouldn't make any sense. They would amount to a kind of category mistake, right? So the mind, unlike any physical thing, is unitary and simple, which means it's not composite, which means it can't be broken down. It can't be analyzed any further. So then what characterizes the mind um, as the source of personal identity or selfhood for Descartes is this unity and simplicity. So there is a unity to mind, to consciousness, to soul that's not found in the multiplicity of a body, for example. Um, and so remember, this is what Hume talks about as he begins his skeptical argument as to whether or not there exists any personal identity. He says that some philosophers, and here he had implicitly Descartes in mind, some philosophers argue um, in order to capture the unity and simplicity of the self, that there is some immaterial substance uh, that um, undergirds it or facilitates the obvious possibility of personal identity. Um, and that would be the self or the soul or the I that remains self-same and identical despite changes. Um, and this is, if you recall, exactly what Hume denies. This is the kind of reasoning that he repudiates. And we don't need, we don't need to go into Hume's argument again. Um, but think about that. So what is the self along Cartesian lines? It's mind, soul, consciousness, and all of those are supposed to be unitary, that is um, unified and simple. Um, Yet, what we talked about just a few minutes ago, when it comes to double consciousness, we're talking about a kind of self-identity or mind, which is um, splintered, it's bifurcated into two uh, tendentious or um, um, irreconcilable orders. Uh, and so um, 
we might say then that ordinary consciousness, and we, we talked about this as well in the context of Hegel, right? So remember um, from the John Russen article, we came to the conclusion that the kind of robust self-confidence and ability to recognize oneself as the same across different temporal moments. In short, the unity and simplicity that um, according to Descartes is what essentially characterizes the self, that's possible only in a social or, or cultural milieu in which equal recognition is possible. Uh, so if you grew up um, raised by wolves, for example, uh, without any sort of human social interaction, or um, if, if you were developed through your formative years in a social environment in which um, your very value and worth and presence even is denied or rendered inferior, well, then you would never have these sort of um, experiential resources through which to develop a robust sense of personal identity or selfhood. Um, and so ordinary functioning consciousness that has um, all of these elements before it as necessary developmental conditions, so ontological security that's made possible because of a functioning um, uh, social network, right? Um, all of that is necessary for one to enjoy the sort of natural, ordinary self-consciousness that from a Cartesian point of view, we simply presuppose or take for granted, right? Um, and so when Du Bois talks about double consciousness as um, a mark of, of the consciousness of the black individual growing up in 19th century, 20th century, um, United States culture, American culture. Uh, so the identity of the African American or the Black American is double consciousness, meaning that these individuals, precisely because of a lack of, of, of ontological security, precisely because of a lack of equal recognition within the cultural or societal milieu, uh, they end up developing a non-unified consciousness, uh, one that marks this sort of um, ineliminable and deeply personal and corrosive for that reason, um, uh, kind of contradiction or hostility within one's own persona. Um, so does that make sense so far? Okay, um, for just a couple more minutes, wanted to share the screen here. Let's see. So I'm gonna share the screen and we'll just with the last seven minutes or so do some close reading. So this is what I have highlighted here is an important passage in the forethought. It introduces us to the other main theme, which actually as a word that labels the concept is more recurrent throughout this work and other um, nonfiction pieces of Du Bois. This idea of the veil and of the, co the color line as he calls it. So he says, leaving then the white world, I have stepped within the veil, raising it that you may see or that you may view faintly its deeper recesses, the meaning of its religion, the passion of its human sorrow and the struggle of its greater souls. All this I have ended with a tale twice told but seldom written and a chapter of song. Okay, um, so what is this? What is the veil that he's talking about? And what does he mean when he says he's leaving the white world 
and stepping within the veil. So can anyone just using your own words, having done this reading, um, can you try to explain the veil for us or, or illuminate that idea? So what is the veil? Um, isn't he saying that the veil is like African Americans or something? Uh, well, he's an African American. And um, he's talking about this veil at the very beginning. So this is the fourth thought. So this is like um, <clears throat> the first sort of setting up of the focus or the content of the work as a whole. And we're only reading the fourth thought in the first chapter. Um, although uh, there's a, an important passage um, from, I think it's chapter 11 that'll turn our attention to probably Thursday. Um, so he's trying to characterize for the reader what they're getting into here. So um, let's just go back a little then. So I have sought here to sketch in vague, uncertain outline the spiritual world in which 10,000 Americans live and strive. First, in two chapters, I've tried to show what emancipation meant to them and what was its aftermath. In a third chapter, I pointed out the slow rise of personal leadership and criticized candidly the leader who bears the chief burden of this race, uh, to, of his race today. Uh, then in two other chapters, I've sketched in swift outline the two worlds within and without the veil, and thus have come to the central problem of training men for life. Venturing now into deeper detail, I have in two chapters studied the struggles of the massed millions of the black peasantry, and in another, have sought to make clear the present relations of the sons of master and man. Leaving then the white world, I have stepped within the veil, raising it that you may view faintly its deeper recesses, the meaning of its religion, the passion of its human sorrow, and the struggle of its greater souls. So what is the veil? He mentions it a couple sentences up. So there are two worlds within and without the veil, beyond and under, you might say, the veil. So before we can name what the veil is, what are, let's say, the two worlds that are separated by it? What are the two worlds that this veil functionally um, distinguishes or delimits for us? Is it the white world and like that of the African-Americans? Good, yeah. So it's the world in which um, not simply black people, but African-Americans in particular have to live and struggle uh, versus um, white society, which is never presented in this context as white society. That is as a specific um, set of cultural and social functions uh, which have a particular history and trajectory to them. They, uh, that is the white world as such is simply established, especially at this time in our nation's history as the world, as the way things are. So white then is a designator for um, the ordinary state of affairs of the world, um, the normal, let's say, the natural, and then black is something additional. Uh, black is something um, secondary, which is then uh, problematically understood as derivative from and inferior to 
what's simply embraced without any careful reflection as um, universal humanity, right? So uh, the human with a capital H is then identified with white. Um, and America then is identified as essentially white. Um, and so black Americans then, insofar as they're not just American, but they are qualified in their presence and identity as African American or as black American are somehow American, but insofar as American is, is understood to be white, they're also not American. So it's a kind of contradictory self-consciousness. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's a kind of contradictory self-consciousness. But notice there's some subtlety in the text here, what he's saying. Um, he is in this work. So his project in, in publishing this series of chapters is to um, step within the veil. So that suggests that Du Bois had in some way been able to escape the veil, right? So as a black man in 1903, he is in writing this book and publishing it for our readership. I mean, here we are over a hundred years later. He wants to step back into the veil, which he was somehow able successfully to escape in order um, to raise it up for us, for the reader, such that we may view faintly its deeper recesses, that which goes on beneath the veil, um, a kind of place or world to which we usually don't have access. Um, that is those of us who are not African-American, who do not have that sort of um, difficult identity. Um, and then to show then the meaning of its religion, so you could understand that to be the meaning of, of the ordinary rituals and community practices of, let's say, uh, the sort of um, abstractly monolithic African-American community, uh, what defines their social relations. Um, so you might say that that has to do with uh, religion, um, the passion of its human sorrow. So the deep uh, pathos of the experience, the lived affective experience of these individuals and the struggle, the struggle of its greater souls with which Du Bois obviously identifies as someone who was able through great difficulty uh, to um, not perfectly, but in some manner, step outside of the veil, at least to achieve sufficient distance from it in order to present it as the veil that it is. Whereas normally, um, it's this sort of nameless, invisible barrier that separates uh, the ideological worlds of these kinds of experiential realities. Um, so does that, does that make sense as kind of setting up this project here? And so at the beginning of class on Thursday, uh, we'll, we'll spend some more time digging into the problem of double consciousness. And I can point you in that direction. So on page five, um, he, he brings it up. And so it's the paragraph <clears throat> that begins with, after the Egyptian and Indian, the Greek and the Roman, the Teuton and Mongolian, the Negro is a sort of seventh son born with a veil and gifted with second sight in this American world a world which yields him no true self-consciousness, like Descartes, remember, that would be true self-consciousness, but only lets him see himself through the revelation of the other world. Okay, so that's where he begins this um, conceptual unpacking of double consciousness. All right, so uh, we'll leave it there. We'll get out of here early and I'll see you guys on Thursday. Thank you. All right, see ya.